Welcome to Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. I am Sharon Reed in for the good doctor today. He has the day off, but we can tell you he's been working very hard even though he is not present on the show today. Rivana is our special guest host today, Rebel HQ extraordinaire. We love to have her commentary in presence. We begin today with a another one, another Indisputable exclusive, a black man shot and killed in Independence, Missouri. It followed a short vehicle pursuit in which the suspect ran a red light. Watch. Sudden burst of gunfire after this 39 year old black man, reportedly, we saw what we saw, surrendered the vehicle at a complete stop, police seemingly in control of the situation. Let's give you the background here. 39 year old Tyree Pryor died. This was on March 11, last year, 2022. There he is with his family. Police said Pryor crashed in the intersection of 24 Highway and Nolan Road. Indisputable obtained Missouri State Highway Patrol's investigation. And let's see what it shows. Well, you see it there. One officer, Christopher Walker, was quoted by Missouri State investigators stating, and somebody yells gun, and I don't know why. I thought it was one of our guys securing the weapon. Pryor's attorneys said this statement is a key admission by police that even they did not know why officers started firing. One of the independence officers, Officer Christopher Steele, secured a rifle that was jammed in the center console of the crashed vehicle. We'll show you now an excerpt from the Missouri State Highway Patrol's investigation. Officer Steele said he attempted to secure the firearm, but it was stuck, so he stopped. While describing attempting to secure the firearm, Officer Steele made a motion with both of his hands as if he were grabbing an item with an overhand grip, pulling it toward himself. The report continues, he then heard someone on the exterior of the car say, he's reaching again, he's reaching again. And someone else say, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. Officer Steele described while he was still in the back seat, rounds come inside this car. He said he took cover in the back seat and was eventually able to crawl out the back door. An attorney from Pryor's family told Indisputable Pryor himself was pinned by the steering column, injured in the wreck, unable to move freely in the mangled vehicle. Days after the crash and shooting, Pryor's family spoke to a local NBC affiliate saying police didn't tell them their family was dead. For days, the family didn't know. No one said anything about him being any kind of aggressor or doing anything to justify anything that happened that day. That from the brother-in-law of Tyree Pryor, Nigel Johnson, telling NBC 41 in Kansas City, Missouri. Here's Pryor family attorney speaking with indisputable. 
I can't speculate as to why they did what they did, but the evidence and videos show us very clear that these are officers who are out of control. Reckless disregard for human life, shooting a man who was incapacitated, inability to do anything to them through his physical state who was trapped by a stirring column after an accident who had no means to cause them any harm at all. One officer knowledge. I don't know why they were shooting. The gun was secured. Lack of training. And to be honest with you, they saw a black face in a car and somebody said gun and they started shooting. There's no way we need to slice it, dice it any other way than what it is. Mr. Pryor should not be dead today. Mr. Pryor should be recovering. Mr. Pryor may be in jail or prison for running or whatever, but he should not be dead and gone. So experienced attorney there, Harry Daniels already making the case using the police report, their own words, showing, making a case that the 39 year old should be alive today. He's represented by Harry Daniels, the aforementioned who we just heard there and Armita Dupree. Daniels telling indisputable priors hands were fixed on the steering wheel when the officer shouted gun and again started shooting. In the video following the shooting, Tyree's girlfriend, Cindy Kendrick, is crying and dragged away from the car by police. Representative of the Missouri State Highway Patrol confirmed his office investigated the incident, but told Indisputable it would likely take a couple days before he could produce even a statement. The Independence Police Department did not immediately respond to Indisputable's request for comment. Here is the chief of the Independence Missouri Police Department. His name is Adam Dustman. Ravana, we saw what we saw in the footage there. This happened, you know, days and days ago at this point, but perhaps relatively early in this. Let's start with the family and not being told key details for days, not even knowing where or what happened to their loved one. Yeah, I think, and we see this happen a lot in cases of, of police murders. Um, the family has a right to know, of course, immediately they should be informed. But it sort of is evidence to me that the police department knows that they've messed up. And they're trying to delay having to tell the family about the, the fact that they murdered this woman's boyfriend, the you know father of his children. Um, so that's number one that definitely strikes me as as suspicious. Of course, we saw the footage. We know that he was unable to grab the gun. And I think that Harry Daniels, the attorney, got it exactly right when he said that these are officers of chaos. They didn't, they could have shot the officer that was retrieving the gun in the vehicle. Very easily could have shot and killed the other officer. They didn't care. They saw a black man in a vehicle and heard the word gun. They didn't, you know, it's, it's as shoot first and ask questions later for these police officers. We see it time and time again. It's horrific. I do want to say great work to the people at Indisputable and the investigative work they've done into this case to make sure that this story and stories like it are heard. Yeah, again, it's a worldwide exclusive. Dr. Ritchie has had many of them. He's off today, but I know that he personally spoke to Harry Daniels, the attorney, one of them on this case. It sounds like in this, and I'm usually of this mind, you cannot train people to care. Okay, you can't train people to care about someone who is an other, in this case, a black man. But Attorney Daniels talked about a lack of training and you referenced the chaos. Here it is twofold, very bumbling, a lack of procedures here. Even attempting to keep themselves safe, they didn't do it. They put everyone in harm's way, as you mentioned, including the officer and perhaps those surrounding the scene. It's a short pursuit, we don't even know how that went down. Mm -hmm. It is. It's sort of evidence of the myth of the thin blue line. You know, we see it time and time again. And you know, the idea of the thin blue line is that the officers are going to put themselves and their other officers before the safety of the public. But that's not even necessarily true because we see in this case they were willing to kill the other officer in the vehicle so that they could, you know. Shoot an unarmed man, an unarmed black man. But we also see it in times where police officers speak out or attempt to speak out about, you know, systemic racism or sexism or, you know, systemic mishandling of cases within their departments. They will turn on that officer in a heartbeat. 
it doesn't matter. So even the thin blue line, it's <laughs> that they they stand by, they wear the badges of, you know, they fly the flags. They don't even care about that. They definitely don't care about the safety of the people that they're supposed to serve and protect. But they don't even care about the safety of one another. Yeah, and this thing where there's a double standard, if if that were you or I, they would produce a statement like that. They can't even we're not even you know other things that are pertinent to this investigation, but they can't even produce a statement. I'll give you the last word on this one. Yeah, I think that the not informing the family and refusing to produce a statement is, of course, it takes time to conduct an investigation. But everyone now, especially after the story goes out to the public, will have seen the video. We can all tell, we've seen the words, the language the police officer used himself. Something happened here that should not have happened. A man was murdered who should still be alive. And I'm sure when they finally produce a statement, it will be every attempt to sort of vilify the man they murdered and to defend the officers. But that doesn't change the fact that it was an, you know, a situation of chaos that they were supposed to have under control and they murdered a man. Yeah. And they risked the safety of everyone on the scene. So this, I'm sure the statement won't be great, but it should be out already. It's they've yeah. had enough time. Well, and now they have the eyeballs uh, again. World exclusive here at Indisputable. Dr. Ritchie, uh, the fabulous team behind the scenes, is securing that footage before anybody else. And uh, I know that uh, the team's going to continue to follow it because this one, this one's going to have consequences, um, and we'll see what they are. We'll move on now to Florida. They're at it again, okay? A bill would prohibit black fraternities and sororities, okay? This has to be unpacked, okay? Because I I see a Q dog over there and alpha over there. And of course the Kappa men who are standing up saying, excuse me, AKs too, deltas, I won't leave anybody out. But this is what is going on in Florida, how much is too much? Recently, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, very vocal about his visions. Is that is he really a visionary? Is that what we're doing? His visions for higher education in the Sunshine State. I don't know if we can go vacation there anymore. I don't want to hurt the good people of Florida. There's some down there, you know. But this is what your governor's doing. Who elected him? Okay. And that other guy lives down there too. But we'll stick with Ron DeSantis. The proposal of the controversial House Bill 999. Didn't Herman Cain? Okay, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but I can't help it, okay? It's the end of the week. You know where my mind it just starts going in many different directions. But I do remember that 999, correct me if I'm wrong. The 999 House Bill could make his vision a reality. The bill aims to restrict the programs and activities in Florida's universities and colleges that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Weren't those good words? One of the Republicans sponsoring this bill's representative, Robert Alex Andre. As him, he claims it won't have an effect on black fraternities or sororities. In a recent House committee hearing, he said this. The campus activities that would be at all discussed or considered by this bill are campus activities conducted by administration and professors in their position of roles of power over students on that campus, student activities not included. But Representative Yvonne Henson, who opposes the bill and happens to also be a part of a black sorority, says her interpretation of the bill is that it could impact the way black sororities and fraternities operate on campus. I think she's a Delta. I, that's my guess, but I don't. You don't want to misidentify because it's a very serious thing. Okay, if she's not, I apologize, Representative. During the House. Committee hearing, Henson voiced her concerns. Of course, he answered that it would have zero effect on operations of student activities, student programs, multicultural centers, black student centers, Latino student centers, or any activities related to students. Although the bill itself seems to impact all of these different activities. That part, WPTV with the interview, Representative Henson there. WPTV noted that line 341 of the bill, Aims to prohibit universities or colleges from using any funds to promote, support, maintain any programs or campus activities that support or adopt diversity, equity, and inclusion. They actually wrote this down, okay? <laughs> he said, 
did, gave this to one of his aides and said, can you put this paper? They, this is what it says, I'm reading what it says, okay? Imagine writing a law that specifically says that if any campus organization makes it a point to be demographically diverse, equitable, and inclusionary, that organization can't get any of our old white money because of that would be divisive. <sighs> Ravana, you go first because I don't know what kind of nutty things I'm gonna say about this one, okay? <laughs> so I need you to be the voice of reason here if you can. Um, I think there's very little reason to find yes. in pr promoting a bill like this. First, I want to say you're absolutely right about the 999 Herman Cain thing. That was his <laughs> his plan. Yes. Um, but um, so first thing, I think that a lot of people who aren't black don't understand the, uh, and I didn't until I went to college, but the the important institutions that historically black fraternities and sororities are for black students and the opportunities they create for those students to create a network and get jobs once they graduate college. So people typically think of sororities and fraternities as just, you know, getting drunk, going to parties, whatever. But one of the most important aspects of, of Greek life is creating a network of people that you can connect with after you graduate, when you're applying for jobs, when you're applying for you know grants, programs, scholarships. That is imperative, especially for black people in America who have you know historically been discriminated against, continue to be discriminated against in employment, in education. You know, these are important resources for those students and you know of course there's this idea that you know he says it's not going to impact black fraternities and sororities they can say that but that doesn't change the fact that it will have a chilling effect on the way that these institutions operate in the state of Florida they will be fearful you know of of you know doing fundraising for the organizations or even having the organizations on campus and the colleges out of fear of violating this bill and be, and stopping receiving funds for their schools are going to be apprehensive if a chapter tries to open on a campus of for one of these fraternities, they're gonna have to think twice about it. Whereas if it's a, a white fraternity or sorority, they won't have to make that same consideration, which is, you know, it's just a racist bill. It's just based on racism. That's it. There's no benefit to this whatsoever, educationally, institutionally, otherwise, you know, you're if you're banning DEI from the classrooms in the first hand, you're, you know, Preparing your students worse than other colleges to go out into the world. On the other hand, you're also opening your school up for more lawsuits and having the taxpayers pay out more settlements for these public institutions because a huge part of DEI at, at universities and is particularly in the workplace is you, it's a piece of evidence you can introduce if you're being sued for discrimination. We have these programs in place. We teach our employees and our students uh, you know, how to navigate the world in a more inclusive way. Now they don't have that piece of evidence to introduce. That's gonna lead to more lawsuits, more settlements, more taxpayer money being paid out for instances of racism on college campuses. Um, so all around, there's just no benefit to it. It yeah. is just racism. What's the upside here, okay? It, I don't know if Ron DeSantis and whoever his aide is just loop the movie School Days or something. Remember Spike Lee's movie School Days? And that, that was a movie. And we love Spike, and there was some truth to it, but you're exactly right. Black fraternities and sororities are about a brotherhood, a sisterhood. It is a lifelong love and bond, okay? And to think that that would be discouraged or would go away is unconscionable. You know, they should. I dated a Q dog once in college, and I will say maybe that one Q dog can go away. <laughs> the rest, though, no, these are glorious, wonderful. And I don't mean to single the Q dogs out, but the name. These are wonderful, storied sisterhood, brotherhood. They do so many great things. And yes, when you're now writing stupidity, you, you better not be inclusive around here. Do I see diversity? It's. This is Looney Tunes now, okay? If Spike's movie had that in it, we'd say this is not, you know, this is the cult classic, no. So, you know, I don't know where this is gonna end. And I think the fact that people continue to 
not allow it, but they complain and then they move on, Ravana, is part of the problem. You can't just allow this to fizzle out. You have to take your boot and stomp it out. Where's the lie? Okay. We'll move on because here we are again. The reaction, the fallout to Ron DeSantis and his goofiness down there, okay? In the state of Florida, this sweet Rosa Park and that story that every school child should know and comes to realize that there was a different time in America that perhaps still permeate today, it will lose context. Because now a publisher has deleted key details in Rosa Parks' story just for the state of Florida. And when we say deleted key details, like the whole thing, okay? It, they're making it seem like one day Rosa Parks just decided, I don't feel like getting up today, I'm tired, I'm just being a little lazy. So I'm gonna just stay seated. No other context, okay? No other context. New York Times has reviewed some proposed changes that publisher studies weekly made to its course materials and found that it erased references to racism in its books telling the story of Rosa Park. According to the Times, the publisher made the changes in an attempt to cater to Florida, which has adopted stricter guidelines on so called woke textbooks under the administration of Governor Ron DeSantis. That's an old picture, by the way. Okay. He's not, he does not look like that. And I'm not going to go further, but you understand what I'm saying. That's an old picture. So I don't know if he put that out or it's been retouched. It should be updated. Florida Department of Education tells the Times that it is entirely permissible to talk about racial discrimination when discussing the civil rights movement and that it did not mandate the proposed revisions to studies weekly's text. The changes in detail. Under the publisher's current version of the Rosa Parks lesson, which is intended for first graders, the book states that Parks deliberately defied a law that said African Americans had to give up their seats on the bus if a white person wanted to sit down. However, in the most recent proposed revision to the book, the text only states that Parks was told to move to a different seat without any explanation as to why. Now, let's pause there, Ravana. Have you ever gone to a function where it says certain seats are reserved? And maybe the sticker fell off the seat and you, you plop down there. They say, excuse me, Rivana, this is reserved for so and so. Would you mind sitting over there? That's how this looks. Where's the context here, okay? From this brave little lady warrior all those years ago, which if we're down in Florida, it seems like it's yesterday, could have happened this afternoon. <laughs> it's horrifying because the story of Rosa Parks has already been so whitewashed in the American education system. You know, schools teach that she was fresh, they te- you know, typically they'll teach about uh, Jim Crow laws and how she had to give up her seat for a white person, but they'll just say she was tired after a long day and didn't want to do it. And she was tired of having to move. When in reality, this was a planned protest. This was a planned protest. She was an activist before and after this. Throughout her life, she was an activist. That she intended to, uh, to not give up her seat. Her and several others went on that bus in an act of defiance against uh, the busing systems there. That's not taught already. So now to introduce a version of events where racism doesn't even come into play. I mean, how could you teach the civil rights movement if you're not even able to teach about racism? And you know, we've t- touched on this before, and I really don't want to say I told you so in this case, but Go ahead. I've been saying this, Dr. Richie's been saying this, you've been saying this, everyone at TYT has been saying this. Even if the laws don't say explicitly that you can't mm-hmm. teach these types of things, they will have a chilling effect. Publishers, teachers, administrators, anyone within the school system or who participates in it is going to be apprehensive to teach things like this for fear of violating the law. And that is exactly what happened here. So Florida can say, well, nothing in the law explicitly says you can't do this, but that publisher has attorneys that mm-hmm. looked carefully at the, the, the letter of the law and decided we cannot include 
lines about racism in our retelling of the story because it will be in violation of the law. And that's exactly what the law was created to do, to scare them out of yeah. teaching about racism. And the publisher, Studies Weekly has accountants too. Cuz they could have just said, we're not changing our books. They could have, I don't know, I wanna feel like Rosa Parks did and have a little <laughs> bit of courage. I don't know, muster up a little, lose a few dollars, okay? I get it, okay? I don't think all of these people who are afraid and have worked for their their life's work, their careers should have to give it all up because the governor is a blowhard, okay? I don't think they should have to. But again, this is a Rosa Parks moment. You're either gonna muster the courage, lose some coins, maybe get hit with a felony. Okay, I know they say the law doesn't expressly say you're right, Ravana. Okay, you're always right, by the way. We love you. It's sick. How about you don't change the book instead of being like a feather? It's just, you're just gonna blow. You just, what's next? You're just gonna keep doing these things? Stop. Another example publications trying to appease Florida officials. Axios dismissed a journalist, Ben Montgomery, after he responded to a press release from the office of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis by calling it, quote, Propaganda. Where's the lie? The press release was regarding a Department of Education event hosted by DeSantis. According to the release, the event is titled Exposing the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Scam in Higher Education. Propaganda. DeSantis has made targeting woke in schools the center of his platform, as well as restricting materials deemed obscene in public schools. Something his critics claim is a way to target LGBTQ or black history related materials. This is propaganda, not a press release. That, that's all it took and then you, really? <laughs> Who's running things? DeSantis, okay? After Alex Lan Franconi, communications director for the Florida Department of Education, shared screenshots online of the reply, DeSantis press secretary Brian Griffin also commented, calling Montgomery's response modern journalism. Vanity Fair Charlotte Klein first reported on Tuesday that Montgomery had been fired over the email. Axios confirmed to Media Light that Montgomery is no longer with the company, but did not specify the reason, at least own it. This reporter is no longer with Axios. Out of respect for our employ respect, do I have to read the whole thing? Or can you all just read it silently off the screen? Are you respect for your employee? This brother got fired for just saying what we all see, like that commercial, Ravana. We all see it. It's First of all, it's so offensive to say that it's out of respect for your employees. I mean, you fired the man for speaking the truth. I also say there's this really pernicious idea, I think that a lot of people hold that journalism is walking the line, right? That you report things from both sides. And if you tell it from both sides, then in the middle is the truth. That's not the case. The truth is the truth. You don't take a little bit of what fascist propaganda says, and then a little bit of what you know righteous activists are saying, and then split the difference, and that's the truth. The truth is independent of, of, of that. So what he did was speak the truth. It is propaganda. He reported or he emailed something that was objectively true and got fired from his job for it. And Axios is a right leaning you know, news conglomerate. So I'm not like surprised necessarily that they would take his uh, take DeSantis's team's side in this. But it is really disheartening because the right wing wants to have you believe that they're fighting the good fight for ethics and journalism. When in reality, they're just trying to silence people who disagree with them, people who wanna report the truth. They want them silenced, who who have the nerve to call out their BS. I mean, it really is, it's propaganda, that's all it is. Yeah, and you would think somebody who is married to a former journalist, Jill DeSantis, the former journalist and television host. Well, never mind. I'm not surprised, <laughs> you know how many people I sat next to and I said, did you even, you don't know anything about what's going on in the story <laughs> and your hair, it's, it's too much hairspray. <laughs> okay, I once got in an argument with a girl who kept spraying and spraying. You know, spraying chemicals all over the place, and not all of us want that. I like flyaways. 
and I'm gonna keep mine, okay? This whole thing is a mess down in Florida, but we've got, boy, that was a big block. A world exclusive that we're gonna follow up on, disheartening. And then the rest down in Florida, much more indisputable with the lovely Ravana, our Rebel HQ extraordinaire guest host today when we come right back. This is Indisputable, I'm Sharon Reed in for the good doctor today. Dr. Richie has the day off. Let's get you some viewer comments. A lot of you had plenty to say about that exclusive 39 year old black man who seemed to surrender after a crash and suddenly he's gunned down, killed by police. Mo Fury says, these officers are trained to be scared of everyone not in uniform. They are hired as cowards and turned into scared MFers with weapons. I find that profound. Profound, Mo. Mickey C, the silver haired dragon. Two words need to be added to the law, whether it's sleeping in bed, holding a remote, holding a cell phone, sitting quietly, walking, speaking, and all other normal human actions. The law needs to read doing whatever while black. Observant, correct, Mickey C. Oh, yay, Vana, Moon Dragon loves you. Thank you for the gift, you too. Uh, let's get another comment here, Robin Zag, uh, YouTube. This is about Ron DeSantis, black fraternity sororities perhaps will go away. Rosa Parks just decided to sit on the bus, no context, not allowed to say anything about black people, civil rights, Jim Crow. Robin Zag says, where's Bugs Bunny and his big saw when you need him? Now, I wish you could see the picture she's attached here, but Florida's in the ocean, okay? Like it's detached in the picture. Tiffany Cross was right, and then y'all, okay, vindication. Uh, thank you for your comments. And now, I'm all for taking out the trash, but I wish you Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a In Sunday? You feel free, back off! I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Hi, why are you littering? Because I feel like it. Take a picture, man. You know what happens? If dumbasses like you would mind your own business, it'd be a better world. How's that for an answer? I got a bike crash. There's a there's a trash can right here. I don't give a damn. There's a trash can sitting right there. I threw it out the window. Why would now you go yourself? Why would you do that though? You live in Alaska. It's the last great unspoiled place in America. Yeah, I know all about it. I was born here. Okay. You'd think you'd want Go to take on. better care of it. Bye, lady. We're eating dinner. You're making me sick. Uh, he, we don't have an issue with him eating the double elk burgers in Alaska. Okay. We don't, that's what you want to do. Okay. But why would you throw those? So many cartons, so many cartons just out the window like that. Or do people, I'm asking Rator, do people still do that? People do do this, Ravana. Why? Why do that? I have no idea, but I do love him saying, you're disturbing us eating our dinner. And his dinner is eating fast food in his yeah. car in a parking lot. <laughs> With his wife and Wilfred Brimley got really defensive there <laughs> after <laughs> after she called him out. And you know, I am a big Getting proponent of minding your own business. Mm -hmm. I really, I firmly believe in minding your own business. But it, you pointed this out in the break. It's so much trash. Just in it's, and she goes, I'm gonna throw this out the window too. She throws a whole bag of trash out the other window, and uh, it really is so disrespectful. And she points out, you know, we're in Alaska. It's, we you celebrate the fact that we're supposed to be the last unspoiled area of America. And he's like, I know, I I live here. That's why I throw my garbage on the ground without the respect for the land or for anybody else. It is. It's just an act of disrespect and laziness. But to some point, it's like, it's not just laziness because you're yeah. so close to a trash can. You're in mm -hmm. your car. You could just drive to the trash can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you wanted to keep continue with that laziness, and I will say this, I'm with you. You know, when when I first saw this, I, you know, kind of multitasking. Oh, people should mind their own business. Just leave this old guy alone. No, not 
You, you ever see, and I've watched documentaries on it because that's just who I am, the garbage patch in the ocean. Mm -hmm. This is sick. It's an, You can actually walk on it and you can probably build a house out there. And it runs miles wide and miles deep and it's full of trash. There's tires and string and fish and plastic straws they're caught in and all kinds of just, it is so gross. And I don't know what we're gonna do to get out of this thing. There's like seven of them, I think, okay? The team will tell me if I'm wrong, but it is sick. And these, these cartons that he's throwing out, these double burger carton, they're in the ocean. So it is our business. That who does this? Who does that? And I thought I saw someone crawling around the back seat. I thought I saw some hair popped up in the back seat. There's there were more cartons in there, and you know they're just having some kind of a, a get together in the vehicle, and then dumping it out on the side, just on the side of the road there, parking lot. I, I, it really disgusted me. Okay. We'll move on, speaking of disgusting, gangs are out of control and they're everywhere. Gangs are out of control in America and they must be stopped. They're very dangerous. What gang? Sheriff and some deputies, that's who we're talking about. Charged over alleged kidnapping. This is the gang we're talking about here. Iron County, Missouri Sheriff Jeff Burkett, he's on the left. You've seen better days. Deputies Chase Bresh and then left center. Matt Kozad, right center. They've been charged with multiple crimes, including street gang activities, misusing 911, stalking, making a false report, looking up criminal records under false pretense, and attempted kidnapping. Who needs Chug Knight when these are the charges? These are former. I don't know, the former men of the law, I don't know, they're gangs. This is gang activity. What, what I just described, had I not told you where they collected these people from? He said, oh, the gangs and the people throwing up gang signs and the colors. And yeah, the colors blue in this case, the sheriff and the deputies. According to the charging documents, they were helping Donald Rick Gaston on the right, an Iron County resident with a scheme to kidnap Gaston's children from their mother after a domestic dispute. Well, you boys are brilliant. This is really goofy and scary. Burkett is being held on a $500,000 bond and the three others are being held on $400,000 bonds. Why the $100,000 difference? They all chose to get in this thing together, but okay. According to the charging documents, the domestic incident between Gaston and the mother of his child occurred February 8th. He was physically aggressive with the woman. Court documents allege that between February 10th and 11th, Burkett, Gaston, Bresnahan, and Kozad tried to help Gaston kidnap his daughter following the domestic incident. Brilliant. The men made a fake request for the detention and arrest of the mother of the child. To the Washington County 911 Dispatch Center to help facilitate the kidnapping of the child. The men also accused they are of putting a fake stop and hold instruction on the child's mother's record. So if any police officer stopped her, she would be detained. The men are also accused of getting the mother and daughter's real time location by fraudulently obtaining a ping from their cell phones. Gaston then used that information to go to a location in Jefferson County where they were seeking refuge from him, scary. Sheriff is accused of obtaining criminal history information under false pretense by telling Washington County 911 dispatchers that the child's mother had kidnapped her daughter, was intoxicated, and that the child had been injured. KSDK News with all the details here. When trying to locate the child's mother, one of the dispatchers asked Burkett some follow up questions. Burkett responded by saying it was being Done at Gaston's request and the dispatcher said he could hear another man's voice saying the same thing as if the unidentified male was telling Burkett what to say. Again, I didn't say they were brilliant. I said this is gang activity that has to be stopped. Sheriff is also accused of misusing emergency telephone services for making repeated calls to 911 for non-emergency situations. They tell school kids. 
It's, it's an emergency, okay? Use the non emergency number for other nonsense. It caused operators or equipment to be in use when emergency situations may have needed such operators or equipment. Sheriff also allegedly caused a false report to be made to Washington County 911 dispatch that a parental kidnapping had occurred and that the child's life was in danger because of her mother's actions. I don't want to keep referring to Suge Knight. He a lot smarter than this lineup, Ravana. This is such an abuse of power. And I wanted to use the word gangs, 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 gangs repeatedly. Because forget that they were in uniform. It's descriptive of the conduct, no? No, absolutely. And I'm really glad that you use the term gangs because there are Police gangs that operate with impunity. These morons, these bozos got caught. But just anyone watching, Google LASD gangs and see the, the systemic gang activity within the LA Sheriff's Department and how they operate and protect each other and protect themselves from any sort of accountability within those white supremacist gangs. Um, that being said, I'm glad to some extent that these people were complete idiots and, and got caught quite easily, but it does Worry me that you know there are you know I think most cops are dumb cops, but there's some smart ones out there who are able to cover their tracks and get away with it. And we know that police have a higher tendency to commit domestic violence than other groups of people. So you know it seems like the wife was very fearful of him because of a domestic situation, which I'm assuming he perpetrated, and she caused her to flee from him somewhere where she thought she was safe. Her and her child, where he couldn't reach her, and he used his ability uh, as a police officer or with connections in the police department to track her down and, you know, harass her. And it's it's really horrible. And thinking about the level of just the ability the police officers have to go through our records and have all of these details of our lives at their disposal. We don't know whether or not they're using it to stop criminals or for more nefarious reasons. And this is one of those cases where it's nefarious reasons. It and you know, getting the ability to ping the cell phone to track Scary. her down. Horrifying. Yeah. Just she horrifying. Was, she was they were seeking refuge. Okay. So yeah. And anecdotally, I can tell you that I do have too many friends. Who have said to me, I used to be married to a police officer. I used to have, been, and this is not isolated. Okay, again, that's okay. We got to go out west to San Francisco. We'll do that right after a quick break. This is indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. I'm Sharon Reed filling in for the doctor today. Ravana is our special guest co host. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this edition of Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. I'm Sharon Reed in for the good doctor today. Ravana is our special guest host today, providing commentary. We love having her on. Your comments, YouTube, see Michael Henson, thank you so much. Some police departments are gangs because that's how they act with the public. So this story isn't so surprising, unfortunately. Out of Missouri, sheriff and deputies arrested, kidnapping among the allegations there. You're so right. See, Michael, so right. We appreciate you. Shiva Mahadev, member for two months, thank you. Police are addicted to an adrenaline rush that only hunting humans can fulfill for them. We need change immediately. And remember how policing in America started, hunting humans. Hmm. Sketch E Assassin, welcome to Indisputable. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here, always a pleasure to share the time with you. This next story, well, it, it got me puzzled when the team pitched it this morning, and I was I didn't quite understand. San Francisco, the NAACP, National Association of Advancement Color People. Is that right, Ravana? Okay. They're they're for black people and helping and assisting black people. The NAACP is rejected though. Reparations for slavery, the proposal. Money in the hands of the descendants of slaves. What goes here? An inner 
An interesting rather division between the NAACP and the city of San Francisco unfolded Tuesday on exactly what the best What's the best way to rectify the systemic conditions affecting black Americans following an ongoing centuries long struggle? After years of deliberation on the topic of reparations, the San Francisco committee has finally gained traction on a wide scale proposal to dispense cash allowances to descendants of slaves in the city. These are the committee's provisions. City appointed committee proposed $5 million payouts to black adults who are descendants of enslaved people with a guaranteed annual income of at least $97,000 for 250 years. Huh? Committee also proposed the elimination of personal debt and homes in San Francisco with a price tag of just $1 a family. Okay. Despite the traction gaining in the community, the NAACP swiftly voiced their disapproval of the proposal. And I said to the team, who who took over out there? Is Candace Owen now the (laughs) president of the chapter out there? Jason Whitlock maybe? No, put his picture back up. Now let's tell you who said, nah, you don't want $5 million. Baptist church pastor, Reverend Ames Brown, is the San Francisco NAACP president. He tweeted out his rejection of the proposal in favor of more system oriented solutions. The tweet from Brown and the NAACP voice displayed their conditions of disapproval, mentioning several institutional concerns regarding healthcare, education, jobs, housing, and a cultural center. Here's the response. There have been those both in large support of the proposal and those harshly critical of it. Those more critical say it's simply too economically encumbering to the city or they oppose the idea of reparations. Now, do you see why I asked you if Jason and Candace had taken over the NAACP in San Francisco? I think it's a fair question, not the case. Raphael. Mandelman, a district supervisor, District 8, San Francisco, spoke up in response to the backlash to remind the community of a larger purpose. Raphael Mandelman made a plea for sanity when he shared this with ABC News. Those of my constituents who lost their minds about this proposal, it's not something we're doing or we would do for other people. It's something we would do for our future, for everybody's collective future. Now, I don't quite understand that quote either, but okay. Despite the approval made by the Board of Supervisors, among the protesting voices are those who blast the proposal, such as Xavier Durose. Xavier, former renowned BLM activist, suddenly reversed course. He reversed many of his ideas when he became a pundit for a conservative advocacy group, Prageru. Am I saying it correct? Ravana will tell us. Prager you, yeah. Okay, maybe I did it on purpose, Ravana, because I don't <laughs> really care about the group, but okay. Disgusting, okay, that's what he called this proposal on Fox News and claimed that this is a method of gaslighting black Americans. He also had this to say after his appearance with her. <sighs> after my appearance on Fox News, I see articles asking who I am. I am the left's worst nightmare. I nearly spent my entire life believing their lies until deep diving into the truth. Now I expose the America last Marxist and remind people how privileged we are to be Americans. Is it Fox News put out that statement for him? Okay, as he gets a stipend for each show. I have no information, the team has not confirmed that. That was my comments, Ravana. Okay, I need you to weigh in now before I get to the rest of this. Yeah, it, what's confusing to me is so these are these you know ideas about reparations haven't been adopted yet. They won't they won't vote on it till June. So they're just you know weighing several different options. So coming out strongly against one option that would put the money directly into the hands of people who have been victimized by the legacy of slavery so early 
or at all is ridiculous to me, especially when you know I'm really partial to reparations in the form of systemic change so that it can have a, an impact and lasting impact. I'm also really partial to cash reparations. I don't see why you can't have both. So shooting uh-huh. down an idea, again, just so early on in the process that is gonna benefit a lot of people is and to come so strongly <laughs> against it. I was just baffled by the story. I thought I read the article title wrong the first time I read it. I was like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I I just can't wrap my head around it. And it raises other questions. And again, it's just, I'm a journalist and it makes my little spidey sense go up. And I say, what else is going on here? And who stands to benefit? It's just a blanket question I have. And I would like to see what emerges in the weeks and years to come. Why can't we have both? By the way, you've done it for other people. So knock it off, okay? And I don't want to disparage the Reverend, okay? I mean, he could have been on a party line with Jason and Candace, but this could just be his doing. But to shoot out this statement as if, you know, all black people agree with you, like you said, such a strong reaction. No. What do you mean, no? I want, and I don't know what the other measures in it are, Ravana. But if it's, if I could move to San Francisco or just, you know, and get my dollar house, and that ninety-seven thousand dollars for the next two hundred fifty years, I, yeah, okay. And guess what? The descendants of slaves deserve this and more because who built this country and didn't get anything for it? Except hurt, pain, death, torture, and robbed of their history. That would be, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think one of the backlashes against these proposals is often that it's, we're taking money from white people and giving it to black people. And then there's always a strong reaction from white people that, well, I didn't own slaves. My family didn't own slaves. But it's not, reparations is not. Like me giving you Sharon five dollars <laughs> right now, right? It's tax dollars, which you're already paying. So it's going to a million other things already. SBB and the bank, I right, apologize. And, and everybody is paying in to the taxes. So it's not just they're taxing, there's a special tax for white people to create reparations. It's not how these programs work. So like really, and I think underlying all of the strong oppositions, especially from white people in America to reparations is you know, lingering racism is what it is. Perfect button, it's the perfect button. And it's a story we're gonna keep following in case something else comes up, emerges as to why this would be be so opposed to it. Uh, We'll move on because this next story, I joke with you in the break that I want Ben Stein to go sit at a Waffle House and leave (laughs) us alone, please. Okay, he likes to talk about syrup, go to Waffle House. And leave us alone with this nonsense. You know, he's he gets paid forty to seventy thousand dollars. I looked it up. I don't know who's booking him these days, but that's what it said. Washington Speaker's Bureau. I looked it up. Ben Stein says, <laughs> maybe I should give the intro first. What in the red state hell? You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face. It's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math. Somebody say amen. I was a child growing up in Maryland and uh, spending a lot of time in Washington, D.C. I would drive by the neighborhoods uh, with my parents driving the car where predominantly black people, in fact, almost all black people lived. And they looked so raggedy and sad, and their neighborhoods were so run down and miserable. I just thought, wow, what a horrible way for these poor, honest, decent citizens to live. If I woke up in the morning and I were, as we call them then, a colored person, a black person, we call them now, I'd want to kill myself. And that was, let's say, 60 years ago. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if I woke up and were a black person, I would think, well, I have every opportunity 
opportunity to go to a really good school. I have every opportunity to live in a really good neighborhood. I have every opportunity to get a really good job. The whole system is now set up so that I, as a black American, can have every chance at a good life. And that is incredible, unbelievable progress. It's never discussed in the media. This guy had that one iconic line in the movie. And I think I have it right, right? That was him, right, Ravana? Bueller. Bueller. Ben Stein. Just stick to that. He's still talking about black people. And it's getting a little crazy, okay? He's either a staunch racist who hit it for some time. And now plaque or whatever is building up on his brain. He cannot stop himself from revealing it. He says black people should stop complaining. Why would I do that? I like to complain. Why would I do that, Ben Stein? You understand, he's babbling on and on about something, riding with his parents and driving by black people. Like, what was that movie Eddie Murphy did, Trading Places? This is not Trading Places, Ben. And again, I want him to just go sit at Waffle House and enjoy his days and leave the rest of us alone. Still though, he has his supporters. He makes filthy racist statements like that. And there's people who come out of the woodwork to support him. Such as disgraced Dilbert cartoonist, (laughs) Scott Adam. He came to Stein's defense online. Ben Stein is getting the fake news racist treatment from the Peacock class. All stories about public figures are fake in one way or another. The public learned a similar lesson about science, but it is taking longer to realize the human stories are pretty much all fake as well. Okay, you can take a shot at Fauci now. Fauci's to blame for Ben Stein's racism. Ravana? Yeah, he said that if he woke up as a black person, he would want to kill himself, which is funny because incidentally, that's the same way I feel about Adam Scott coming to my defense. Oh. But um, so he says that now black people in America have every opportunity to live in a good neighborhood and go to a good college and go to a good school. And I mean, he could come here to Chicago and say that to the the poor black kids who live on O Block. And I I really don't oh. think. I really don't think that it would rain true. There's I want him to go to that block. Can we <laughs> buy him a ticket tonight? I've got a lot of frequent flyer miles and I'm happy to donate. Ben Stein to go. Where do you want to send him, Ravana? Go ahead. Go. Bring him here, Chicago. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it is really ridiculous and ignorant. First of all, who asked you, Ben Stein? Why are you even opening your mouth? You said just sit at Waffle House, eat your waffles, and mind your business. Because you know, who's recording the video? Also, like, what was the like? He asked someone to hold their phone up so that he could go on some racist rant, as if black people are always coming up to him, Ben Stein, and discussing you know their trauma and the struggle of being black in America. It's just. Absolutely ridiculous, and it, it's so, you know, it's such an example of of how so many white racists act every day, where it's as if people pointing out racism is in some way harmful to them. Yeah. It's somehow, you know, his business, and it's 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 somehow harming him as an individual, which is just ridiculous. But again, Scott Adams coming to his defense, he's got great company there. Yeah, speaks volumes, and they can go ahead and they can be pals and. Facebook friends and whatever else they want to do. Again, this is a man who had said his speaker's fee is forty to seventy thousand dollars. I wouldn't give him four dollars and seventy cents. You understand? <laughs> and if I did, I'd want two seventy-five back. Okay, maybe he could buy a hot dog at Costco with the rest. <laughs> That's all this is worth. And by the way, I meant what I said. I'm black and I like to complain, and I have a right to complain. Let's run it down for you. The most common complaints by Black Americans are. Huh, According to a recent poll conducted by the Pew Research Center, about six in 10 black adults say racism and police brutality are extremely big problems for black people in the US today. Thank you, Pew Research Center. But you need to spend a dollar on that. You could have called me and I could have told you facts all day, okay? Racism, 63%, police brutality, 60, economic inequality, 54, affordable health care, 47, efforts to limit voting, oh, voter suppression, 46. Quality of K through 12 schools, our future, 40%. Racial discrimination, 
We're going to keep complaining, Ben. You get over it. In terms of government institutions standing in the way of progress, many black adults say institutional overhauls are necessary to ensure fair treatment, okay? Kind of like what you were talking about with reparations, okay? Prison system, policing, the courts, judicial process, political system, the economic system, the healthcare system. Gee, what are we satisfied with? Hmm. In terms of the percentage of black Americans that think the following issues have little chance of being resolved. That means little hope, just like it says there, among black adults that change is likely. Reparations to descendants of people enslaved in the US, little hope, 82%. Thanks, San Francisco, NAACP, chapter head. Changes to the prison system, 67% say little hope. Changes to policing, 58%, little hope. Does is Senator Scott vote in this? Senator Tim Scott, was he part of this? The team will let me know, please. Equality for black people in the US, 44% say little hope. Ben Stein, put up his picture again if you can for me. Because really, it really doesn't even need a caption. This is what he's been reduced to. This is who he is, Bueller. Bravana, should we ignore him? Frankly, now I don't even want him at Waffle House. <laughs> he can go to Cracker Barrel and that's not open 24 hours a day. He belongs at Cracker Barrel and he can sit there and do whatever he wants to do. But he has to go home at a certain point. But I don't want to see him up at Waffle House. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because on, on the one hand, I really want him to shut up forever. Oh. On the other hand, I think he really is sort of voicing the opinions that a lot of conservative Americans have about um, black people fighting for equality. Is that things are good enough now. We had a black president. We're fine. Racism's over. You're, you know, you can't, you know, an employer. It's not legal for them to yell the n-word at you anymore. It's fine. Racism is done. But when we can look at these systems and objectively say, you know, and all the research <laughs> proves that, you know, the effects of, you know, uh, slavery and Jim Crow, we still see them in our institutions in America today, and they still harm black people and people of color in this country today and that we have not solved racism in any meaningful sense. So, it, you know, he's holding this opinion that I think a lot of people hold but are a little too afraid to say. So at least when someone says the quiet part out loud, we can call him out and point out that the, the things that, you know, black people are complaining about are real and valid and things that we need to fight and bring attention to. Yeah, I mean, he makes everything sound so simple. Tyree Nichols, if people just comply, is that how you feel, Ben? Is that how you feel? I don't know if his comments were made while he was visiting Florida, <laughs> but shut it, okay? Rivana, remind us how we can find your incredible content and watch much more of you. Yeah, absolutely. So first, thanks so much for having me on. I always love co-hosting with you. Um, but everyone can see my videos on Rebel HQ under the Ravana playlist. You can subscribe to my playlist, get notifications every time I have a video go up, including today. I should have a video up this afternoon. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter at Ravana TTV, where you can get updates on everything that I'm doing. All right, well, we love it. And I'll be watching, looking out for that content. We appreciate you always. The bullpen is next. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. And today we have a very special guest for us. Christian Daytok joins us, Washington correspondent for the Washington Examiner, an experienced journalism professional, wide range of editorial business roles, credible background, including campaign reporter, editor, audience and revenue development manager. Welcome to the bullpen, Christian. Thanks, Sharon. It's always great to join you guys here on the Young Turk. So I appreciate the invite back. All right, and I want to start with this because people will perhaps remember this recent viral moment. Is the president uh, annoyed, frustrated uh, with Marion Williamson for jumping in the race ahead of him? Did he want a clear field to run uh, against the Republican nominee in 2024? Just not tracking that. I mean, if I had a, a uh, what is it called, a little 
a little globe here, crystal wall. Crystal wall that I can tell you, but I, I <laughs> imagine eight ball, whatever. If I can feel her aura, I, I just, I just don't have anything. I just don't have anything to share on that. I'm, oh gosh, you guys are making me laugh now. It's all giggles, huh? It was all kicks and giggles, and I wonder. Well, first, let me get your reaction in the room, uh, both your personal reaction and from those around you, the other journalists? Well, being genuinely honest, anytime we ask Karine Jean-Pierre about the 2024 election, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, she usually uh, sidesteps the question by citing the Hatch Act. So it was surprising to get that little bit of color out of the press secretary. That being said, I sort of sensed an undertone of Slight frustration. I'm not going to say, you know, they're they're actually mad at Marion Williamson, but President Biden wanted to run unopposed. He wanted to focus all of his intent on whoever the Republican nominee is going to be. And this is just one more thing that he actually has to take care of. Now, do I think Marion Williamson has a legitimate chance of beating President Biden in the primary? I don't think so, probably. That being said, he needs to go out and campaign, needs to uh, probably appear in a debate or two. Uh, this is just one more thing the president has to deal of when he really wants to be focusing on Republicans. So, so much in politics is this uh, system that is so unfair, okay? Republicans, Democrats, and each side believes that they're promised certain things and that it can only be between them. You use the word frustration there, but how much of it also then was the other F word fear that she could take votes, not just attention, but take enough votes away from him getting a second term. The fear is real and it's not necessarily fear of Marion Williamson, it's fear of any competitor. Uh, perhaps Ms. Williamson uh, emboldened someone like Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, who previously said he wouldn't be opposing President Biden. Uh, maybe he decides to walk back that promise and jump in the race himself. Uh, again, uh, there's all types of feelings within the White House and within both political parties. I do think one thing that Marianne is saying that's very prescient is that these parties uh, seem to govern the results themselves to a degree. Of course, the Democrats just changed the primary schedule so that South Carolina is the first state to vote. Of course, South Carolina was instrumental in President's big victory back in 2020 on Super Tuesday. Uh, it looks like they want to get this thing with, get this thing done with. Uh, very quickly and not trying to have to dig into the mud and see which candidates feel exactly how they say they feel uh, on all these issues. And then again, uh, it sort of takes uh, individual voters opinions out of the question when you've got both parties trying to sort of rig the primaries for their preferred candidates. What about the strained relationship between the White House, the administration and progressives? And how much work do you think needs to be done prior to announcing, and when is he gonna announce, April, June? I don't know, maybe you have more insight and can take a more educated guess at it. Um, but the strained relationship with progressives, how much can this be fixed? Um, or is he running out of time? I'm gonna take the second part of that question real fast because I'm gonna be blunt with you. Uh, we don't know when President Biden is going to announce. We thought it could have happened in February. Obviously, that time has come and passed. And I think part of the slow roll on that is because of what's happening in the Republican Party. Now, back to the Democrats and the progressive wing in particular, President Biden has a lot of ground to make up uh, with more liberal voters. There's no getting around it. He made a lot of promises on the 2020 campaign trail, whether it was uh, forgiving student debt, uh, passing voting rights legislation, uh, which obviously hasn't come to pass in his first two years in office. So I think there are going to be a lot of rumblings from progressives in the party saying, hey, we gave you the White House. Now it's time for you to make good on these promises. I I'm going to say the president, to his credit, is trying to push on a lot of these issues. That being said, with the, the extremely stratified atmosphere in Congress, it's going to be extremely difficult now that Republicans have control of the House for him to get any legislation done, let alone some of these more progressive uh, principles and proposals that have come forth not only from his mouth, but from some of his top supporters in and out of government. When we think about uh, 
President Biden and perhaps candidate Trump, the former president, squaring off again in a debate. I think many people would say it's appointment television because of the unpredictability of it, Christian. But if he's in a debate with Williamson in a primary, what are the landmines there? Because if you talk about these promises and ground to make up, what about the landmines? Could they really upend a potential run? Some of those landmines are going to be very similar to what you heard back in the 2020 campaign when he was debating President Trump. At the time, Trump talked about how even though he was the sitting president, he wasn't from the establishment and he wasn't a career politician. The way, of course, President Biden hung his hat on that 40 year Senate career. So I'd expect Marianne Williamson to come with sort of that outsider approach. And then again, just like we talked about a few minutes ago, she's going to press him on some of those progressive bucket list items, which he either hasn't been able to fulfill or hasn't even addressed at all during those first two years in office. I doubt it would be you know, a grab your popcorn type, set your DVR event like the debates with President Trump were back in 2020. But I do think it's going to be important for President Biden to come out and impressed to not only Marion Williamson, but progressive voters in the Democratic Party that he's the candidate for them. Okay, now I wanna talk about the press corps, okay? Because I'm so interested after watching what happened 2016 through 2020, and the way the process, the campaigns, the candidates were covered, is the press corps ready? Because there's this inside the beltway arrogance um, that perhaps middle America notices. Outsiders notice, others notice. When you look around that room at your colleagues, give it to us 100. Is the press corps ready? Are they open? Are they fully aware? The press corps is chopping at the bit to get out on the campaign trail again. 2020 was one of the strangest elections that I've ever covered, certainly, and maybe one of the strangest in history because of this idea of. Um, talking with reporters via Zoom, everything happening virtually, those drive-in rallies that President Biden was holding. And of course, everyone wants to go to Iowa. They wanna go mm. to the state fair and eat uh, the butter sculptures yeah, and travel okay. to all the different states. It's very important for the candidates to get out on the campaign trail and the press corps is ready to join them. Ron DeSantis, um, we don't have much time left, but I gotta ask you about Ron DeSantis and have you encountered him? And what do you think the odds are that he jumps in the race? Or is this just let me raise money, money, money and wait my turn? Because again, it's it's promised somehow. It's extremely likely that Governor DeSantis jumps into the race. I would expect that to happen sometime in May after Florida's legislative session takes place. There needs to be some rule changes, which the legislature has addressed in the past allowing state officials to run for national office. That being said, Ron DeSantis might pose more of a threat to Donald Trump's hopes of the presidency than Joe Biden will come 2024. He's a rising star in the Republican Party. He he is looked at by conservatives as Trump without any of the baggage. And I do expect once he formally jumps in the race late this spring or in the early summer, that primary is really going to kick into overdrive. The gloves have come off in the Trump camp, and I would expect DeSantis to start hitting back fast and hard as soon as he formally launches. Well, we hope so, because you know when I saw Ron DeSantis in that one debate where he just froze and just didn't answer the question, I hope he's ready. I don't know where the gloves ever you know were put back on, Christian, when it came to the Trump camp. But I love your inside baseball, love, love listening to you, and we appreciate you always. I want to thank you so much for joining the bullpen. Um, great insight, and welcome Thanks, back Sharon. anytime. Thank you, and we appreciate you watching us and joining us on the bullpen. Till next time. Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today. But what do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here. Congratulations on the new show. And I got to let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. Here's the pattern that we see in all of these Karen stories. They think they own stuff they do not own. Now, where does that come from? I don't know, maybe slavery. Maybe they think they should still own black people. This is what happens when Karens weaponize the police. 
When you're used to privilege, equality seems like oppression. It hits you in a certain way when someone is holding you against your will, treating you like you're a criminal and you're an innocent person. This is something that black people face no matter where they are. A stronger black economy lends itself to a stronger, greater economy. Don't think it's exclusive of you, it's inclusive of you. What's your beef with critical race theory? It adds more fuel to the fire of the racist tendencies that we already have. We have a generation of problem solvers that can remedy the problem if they are properly taught what the problem is. You know who created redlining in this country? Mm -hmm. The white liberal. I, I, don't, I don't give a damn who created it. If it's a racist policy, racist policy, Shelly, here's what I don't know. I don't know. See, there you go filibustering, brother. You're scared of this truth, but you're gonna get it, though.